in order to be great, you have to be bad. Not bad for sport, but bad in the service of great. And so every sustainably great organization is optimized to be great and optimized to be bad. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Thank you, Susan, and uh, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast and to those on the West Coast. Um, good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to have Dr. Francis Fry with me today. Let me do a brief intro uh, on Francis, and then um, we'll dive into our discussion. Um, Dr. Francis Fry is a professor of technologies and operations management at Harvard Business School. Her research investigates how leaders create the conditions for organizations and individuals to thrive by designing for excellence in strategy, operations, and culture. She regularly advises senior executives embarking on large-scale change initiatives and organizational transformation, including embracing diversity and inclusion as a lever for significantly improving performance. A global thought leader on leadership and strategy, Dr. Fry is widely recognized for her dynamic teaching style and breakthrough courses optimized for rapid, lasting impact. She developed one of the most popular classes at HBS, which explores business models that reliably delight customers. In 2017, Dr. Fry was tapped to be Uber's first senior vice president of leadership and strategy with a mandate to help the company navigate its very public crisis in leadership and culture. In her ongoing work with Uber, she is focused on giving thousands of employees the tools to excel in a context of hyper growth, strategic change, and an evolution in cultural values. Dr. Fry is the best-selling author of Uncommon Service, How to Win by Putting Customers at the Core of Your Business. She and her co-author, Ann Morris, published their second book, Unleashed, The Unapolog Unapologetic Leader's Guide to Empowering Everyone Around You in June of 2020. She holds a PhD in Operations and Information Management from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, where she also graduated undergrad majoring in mathematics. So Francis, um, welcome and uh, uh, really a true pleasure to have you. Um, if we back up to your childhood, you were the youngest of six and had a very young mother. Um, what characteristics of the Francis Fry that we know today come from growing up as either the youngest of six or having a young mom? Well, the youngest of six is a, um, I think is a superpower. So I, I think there's a book to be written out there by someone titled The Youngest of Six, because it's, um, it's startling how we get overlooked in a way that is not neglectful and we're free to do anything we want. So I'll give you an example. I'm the youngest of six. My wife, Anne, is the youngest of four. When it comes time around to do the taxes, we both look at each other. Did you do the taxes? Did you do the taxes? Like the youngest of six and the youngest of four don't, aren't the ones, somebody else, it had to have gone through all the other ones till you get there. So we, we grow up in a sort of a protected bubble, which allows us to explore, I think, more than any of the other, any of the other ones. So in reading your history, you applied to 17 colleges, which um, in today's world isn't a huge number because of the common app. But back when you and I were applying to college, applying to 17 colleges is an incredible number of colleges. First of all, what was it in your personality that made you apply to 17 schools? And then what was it that took you to Brandeis to begin? Uh, well, I wasn't sure I was going to get in in any of them. Uh, so uh, I didn't have, you know, there weren't like college guidance counselors or things that, like that. I went to a small public school. Um, so I just uh, just applied to lots, hoping I'd get into one. Brandeis, um, I didn't even know anything about the school, but um, they paid for me to go there. And as someone who came from uh, no means uh, from my family, it was like the easiest decision, um, uh, even, even though I didn't uh, no. Now, the school I really wanted to go to was the University of Pennsylvania. So of all of the others, they were like the backup schools. University of Pennsylvania said no. And you'll like a the theme of me is I'm undaunted. 
by a no. Um, and so I went to Brandeis, but then applied to transfer uh, to Penn and learned at least at the time, it's easier to get in as a transfer than it is as a... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm surprised that you say that Penn was where you really wanted to go, because as you have admitted, you, you, you applied to Harvard five different times before Harvard actually took you as a professor at the business school. Um, where's that tenacity of going back and back come from? Um, other than being six, other than being number six out of six. I, well, I think, I think a lot of it is number six, but I will say, I just don't have the expectation of a yes. It's not been my, it wasn't my experience growing up. I got people said yes to me on the first time very rarely. And I really early on realized that I'm not going to let the decision of a mortal influence my life's trajectory. So I, anytime, so if I got a yes, it was just a surprise, but usually I got a no. And I just learned to think that this is not now and to come back. And so I just had a boomerang resilience to come back. It's not that I wasn't disappointed when they said no, but it didn't change my ambition in any way. I'm not fragile to a no. Your honesty in having applied to Harvard five times before they finally said yes to you does remind me of a quick anecdote that I want to share with you, given that you are at HBS. But my, I went to St. Lawrence University undergrad and was the only St. Lawrence grad in my class at HBS. And as you well know, at the beginning of your first year, everyone sits around in a class of 90 in your section and you do introductions. And the first person to my right says, hi, I'm Ian Huschel, and I went to Harvard undergrad, and I worked at Goldman Sachs, and I did this, and I was on the U.S. national rowing team, and, you know, the, 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 and the, the resume, pianist. just one after the next, and I'm sitting here, and my, and my level of anxiety about saying that I went to St. Lawrence is only getting greater and greater, and on about the third day of introductions, because we do about 10 a day at lunchtime, um, this gentleman named Tim Huckabee stands up and he goes, my name is Tim Huckabee. I, I think he went to Georgia Tech. He said, I went to Georgia Tech. I applied to Harvard Business School three times before finally getting in on the fourth try. And all of a sudden, everyone in the room understood that there was some actual other human being who actually had flaws and had tried something in their life that they had failed at and that they came back after it. And what was so interesting about it, Francis, was from that introduction on, instead of reading their resumes, everyone actually said something about themselves. They said, I like cooking, I um, have a dog, um, I'm from a small town in Indiana, what have you. And it was such a leadership move by Tim Huckabee just to be honest with everyone. And so when I heard you say that you'd applied to Harvard five times before finally getting accepted, I was like, good on her for being open and straightforward about that. I do think the, uh, you, you put so, your on it. It's an authentic, like when we're authentic, it gives license for other people to be authentic. Um, very much so. Um, so in one of your, your research examines how leaders create the context for organizations, individuals to thrive. And one of your classes investigates how organizations build business models that reliably delight customers. Can you summarize for us how, companies like eBay and Oracle and Cleveland Clinic, three companies you've written case studies on, have built business models that quote unquote reliably delight customers? Yeah, so the, the secret is that they also reliably disappoint customers. So here's the trick. Uh, in order to be great, you have to be bad. Not bad for sport, but bad in the service of great. And so every <clears throat> sustainably great organization <clears throat> is optimized to be great and optimized to be bad. I'll give you the simplest example I can of it, which is Steve Jobs at um, when he was creating the MacBook Air. He, cre he wanted to create the lightest weight laptop on the market. Even though he had like the, he cares about excellence more than anyone I ever met. And even he understood if we're gonna have the lightest weight laptop on the market, we're gonna be best in class at weight, we have to be worst in class at physical features because they trade off against each other. He would say, uh, we could be best in class at physical features, but then we're gonna be worst in class at weight. And then he would make a joke, or we could choose to be average at both, but then we'd have to rename the company Dell. This was a great laptop brand. <laughs> Um, but this is, uh, for every one of the companies you mentioned, we can say, you can clearly see what are we optimized to be great at, what's our lightweight, and what's our physical features. And if you can't articulate it, my guess is you will not have sustainable excellence because somebody's going to come around with 
initiative to get better at physical features, not understanding the trade-off. And then you're playing whack-a-mole and you become more and more exhausted and more and more mediocre and more and more similar to your competitors. So in the example you used, we're talking about a computer that you can touch, feel, yeah. bang, pick up, you can really feel it. In the services industry, which most people who are listening today yeah. are likely in the services industry, um, you don't have that product to sit there and say, we're gonna trade off the lightweight versus the features. How do you do it in the service industry? Yeah, and it, and it is hard. I like to think about that services are, thing, products are things you can drop on your foot <laughs> and services you can't drop on your foot. So physics doesn't apply or gravity doesn't apply as visibly, but I'll use a healthcare example. So I can uh, open up a healthcare organization and I can make this promise to you. I will only let you see world-class physicians. It's all I'm ever going to let you see because I care about you that much, but you're going to have to wait a while. Or I could say, I care about you so much, I'm going to get you in immediately. Then obviously you're not going to be seeing world-class physicians because I can't have them being idle while you're there. Or I could choose to be average at both. So this trade-off is being made for companies that are excellent, these, com these trade-offs are being made. But what I see in healthcare tragically, because I think it's the noblest of professions, is that people are going the Dell route. They're trying to be best at as many things as possible. And they consider that there's nobility in at least trying. And what we find is that nobility of effort gets in the way of the nobility of excellence. So even when you can't drop it on your foot, you still have to find out where does physics apply. And so I, does that mean treating distinct clients differently? So I understand the service model that you just said, but at the same time, I don't think that you're also saying that you should lower your customer service. I guess my, I, I go to someone like Costco. Costco has a very clear business model of the way that they present their goods and the way that you interact with them, but they're trying to present that to all customers, whether you're the richest customer who ever walked into Costco or whether you're someone who is cobbling together enough money to go in and buy what you want to buy. So I guess it's the it's it's more the operational service delivery than it is. Yeah, the I'm not talking about customer segmentation, although that's got its role, but I'm talking about within it. So Costco is optimized for people who will buy in bulk for a lower price. They're terrible at things that you can hold in your hand. Right. <laughs> Right. You can, they're terrible for people who want to spend less than a thousand dollars every time they go in there because it's not a quick, it's not a quick trip. Um, do you, I just, when you said that about holding in your hand, do you know whether Costco has lower pilferage than other retailers because of the size of the things that they have? I'd assume wow, so. That's, I would assume so as well. What an unintended, beautiful thing. <laughs> But how I could mean, you pilfer? How could you? What are you going to hack? <laughs> exactly. You got your big cart driving out. I mean, maybe you barge <laughs> through the door with it, but uh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but to your point, you can't hold anything in Costco in no. one hand. And so they're making the thing that's, I think, why they have sustainable excellence is this is a smart business model, but they're super, like, I am sure people have said, let's have single, you know, let's, let's sell Dom Perignon. I think they're the largest <laughs> distributor of Dom Perignon in the country. I'm sure somebody said, let's have single bottles ready for that special occasion. And maybe they were even a charismatic person who said that. And the organization is just like, no, we sell stuff in the cases. Super interesting. So your book, Uncommon Service, How to Win by Putting the Customer at the Core of Your Business. There's not a business on the face of the planet, I would think, that doesn't sit there and say, we're customer centric, we're customer focused, and that they clearly sit around and discuss it and strategize it. But very few actually can execute yeah. upon it. From your research, what do companies that actually put the customer at the center of everything they do actually do? Well, they do get this great and bad thing, like uh, which feels like almost anathema to wanting to have excellence. So they understand, you know, Southwest Airlines is a great service, but <laughs> it's, it's also like horrific on many ways and that one is in service of the others. Uh, uh, so I think they get that right. They also understand the difference between gratuitous service and having a sustainable funding mechanism. So when you're in an organization, everybody has great ideas. Oh, the customers would love this. The customers would love that. And you need the other person saying, how are we going to pay for it? Because everybody wants to give away gratuitous service. People want to give away service that's going to be free. 
what we have to do is build a reliable funding mechanism into it. So I'd say it's in order to be great, you have to be bad. You need a reliable funding mechanism. And these companies that are customer centric, they just give away stuff to cut. They think that that's good service. It's not, that's like temporary service. It's not sustainable. The other thing is that a lot of organizations, when we put customers at the core of it, we think let's do this on the back of heroic employees. Our employees will go the extra mile. Well, that's a terrible service model from a sustainability perspective. I want everyday employees, I want the average employee to be able to reliably produce excellence. I don't want to rely on heroic employees, but so many organizations get addicted to the heroic employee and that actually holds them back. Um, and then the last part of it is that um, for me to deliver like the absolute best service to you, Willie, I'd want you to participate in the production of it. And that again, sounds crazy. Um, but people enjoy the salad bar salad a lot more than they enjoy the one that got del delivered to their table because they got to pick the ingredients. Like allowing people to come in and co-produce it, allowing the customer to co-produce a little bit, it really helps. But that is that freaks out people. <laughs> you know, you're like, ah, but right, all those customers do. So I find that there are four things that you have to get right in order to genuinely, to your point, have the customer at the center of it. And most of them are counterintuitive. Your final point as it relates to the salad bar and, and preparing it yourself reminds me of a study that was done on um, lottery tickets and people selecting their lottery numbers. And so if you gave someone a randomly selected lottery number, and then you said, I want to take that ticket back from you, they'll sell it to you at face value. They bought it for a buck, they'll give it back to you for a buck. But if you let them pick their lottery number, they want a premium to sell it back to you. And it's it's such an incredible yeah. um, study on example. nature and, and, and how people want yeah. to participate in the process. We can create a win-win, you know, um, self-service gas stations gave co-production a bad name because <laughs> it's because uh, I don't get any utility out of and you're just paying me to do the work. That's not what I'm talking about. In fact, I want to involve you and charge you more for it because it's more valuable for you. So on a company that did actually engage the customer and put the customer right at the center of everything was Uber. Um, I remember distinctly the first time I used the Uber Mat app and just how engaged and um, empowered I felt by calling. I mean, I've had plenty of cars meet me at airports before with the sign saying, Mr. Walker. But here I was out on the street corner actually calling this car to come to me and the way it all worked. And I remember that so, so well. But you decided to leave HBS and you decided to leave HBS with a very significant, not only track record as being one of the very best professors at the business school, but also a very senior leadership role in defining curriculum and um, running various programs, et cetera, et cetera. And you not only did that, but you left your family in Boston and traveled out to California for a year, leaving every Monday and coming back on every Friday. What was it about either Travis Kalanick as the founder and CEO of Uber, or I think you visited with 1,500 employees before you accepted the job to leave HBS and go to Uber, which you got to explain to me how you met 1,500 employees yeah. before you actually met. But what was it about either Travis or Uber that said to you, I'm going to leave all this great stuff and I'm going to go not extend myself, not only professionally, but personally? So I will say I very much like burning buildings. So, and it was on the front page of the newspaper and it was a wreck. Now, when I was asked if I would meet with Travis, I said, no, because I read all those newspapers and they made him sound like a dope. And I only help good people win. So I was like, no, I'm not gonna meet because I think I can help anyone win. So I have to like discern. And I was like, no, I've read all about him. And they were like, just come meet him. So I went out to meet him and the meeting, which was supposed to, I flew across the country for a meeting. Like that's how long ago it was. <laughs> But I, I met with him and the two hour meeting, I changed my flight home five times. It, it lasted three days. Wow. And we talked about everything. I got to ask all the questions, like just every nook and cranny. And here's what I uh, adored and adore about Travis is that first of all, his last company before Uber had eight or 12 people. <laughs> when I got there, there were 13,000 people at Uber. Like, you're not born knowing how to manage and lead 13,000 people. So he had like, he didn't think he had it all going on. He needed help. He was asking for help. 
And I just happened to fit the two areas where he needed the most help. I found him very open, um, very, uh, very desiring of a better, you know, of making it better and knowing that he couldn't do it and he couldn't do it alone. Now, so it was that, but I also love the audacity and the purpose. So this was happening at the same time when my mother's um, eyesight was dwindling. She's going to have to, she was right driving her last car. She's a fiercely independent woman. And for her to then have to be reliant on children or neighbors, there's nothing worse for her. And then now there's Uber. And so, and I find that it's my mother who's a grandmother, grandmothers around the world, I heard the same story. They didn't have to go backwards to be reliant on their children. They got to right size their relationship and they got to take care of this vital thing through an app. And my mother, who's like not technological, oh, well, she knows how to call an Uber. <laughs> like she, uh, all of a sudden the technology is, is, is easy. So I would say that the noble purpose, the audacity of doing it and how grim, like I'm in Boston where you couldn't, you could only go to a cab stand. You couldn't wave down a cab on a road. You had to go to a cab stand. And it was like a Saturday Night Live skit of how bad the service was uh, and how uncomfortable it was. And if you'd call a cab, maybe they'd come, maybe they wouldn't. Uber was like a revolution and a revelation for everyone. So I love audacity. I love a noble purpose. And the reason I like a crisis is because I do believe that meaningful change has to happen quickly. And a crisis permits that. Now, I would much prefer people have the sense of urgency without a crisis, but I find that many instances require a crisis to do it. What about leaving a, a job or profession which you, A, were dominating, B, while going in front of 90 new students and or an executive ed group is 90 different minds and different questions and all that, you obviously were expert at that, to lead that to go into an operating role at a company, which yeah. you joined in 98. So you've been in academia for a long time. Yeah. Um, talk for a moment going from the, if you will, the theoretical to the practical. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, it surprised me that I did it because I used to quite openly say the only time I'll ever leave HBS, like I would get called, you know, do you want to be considered for this position, that position? And I was always, no. And I'm like, the only way I'll ever leave HBS is if I go to prison. <laughs> and and I, I meant, I thought it was the only way I'd do it. And, and the only reason I would go to prison is if someone bullied one of my children, <laughs> then I could imagine, I'm from New York, I could imagine things getting out of hand. Um, but I wasn't leaving because it was, I was like living my best life and to your, and it was a sweet spot and it was all working. And then I realized that, and I coach people on how to do things, but and then I realized, okay, nobody else knows how to do this. And if I do it, and then I open source how to do it, this will be the way to democratize education. And so I did it as a way to learn and to see how what I knew needed to be adjusted. But then I, I wanted to show nobody was going to have a worse situation than Uber. And I'm not sure anyone has up until today. And if I could show that that was possible, and that was possible quickly and joyously, well, then everyone else is going to think that it's possible to fix their scenario. So I went there because it was so bad and because it was a way for me to democratize access to education and as a way for me to learn. Now, it was a super difficult decision and we made it as a family because to your point, I mean, commuting to California every Monday and Friday, in retrospect, that was crazy. And I wasn't all that energized on the weekends when I came back. So I probably, I could have rethought how I did it. Um, but it was a chance of a lifetime um, to do it. And we have tried very hard to open source everything we learned on how to do it. Um, the two things on that. Well, first of all, when you got to Uber, you put on an Uber t-shirt. And I think people 
forget how sort of um, challenged the Uber brand was when you joined them. And I think it was 17 or was it 18? 17, right? 2017, June of 2017. Yeah. And, and at that time, I mean, Uber employees would get into Ubers and not say that they actually worked at Uber. It was that bad where people were sort of like, oh, it's not a great place to be. And you put on that T-shirt to say, I'm going to wear this T-shirt and take pride in this T-shirt until we get this culture right. Um, and first of all, I've heard you talk about that and how you sort of second guess that like a week in and two weeks in is the, I was going to be a much better lift on getting the culture back to where it was and not so sure you really wanted to be in public wearing that Uber t-shirt. But fast forward to 250 days later when you actually took it off, what was it that you either saw from a data standpoint or from a cultural standpoint that said to you sort of to some degree mission accomplished? Um, everybody was again, like wearing loot in the, at the quantity that they used to before. Uh, people were admitting that they worked at Uber. People were going out to parties again because the other thing that was happening when I when I got there is nobody would go to a party because everybody only wanted to talk about how grim it was at Uber. And so all of that was like a a faint memory. And we had gotten so far along that it I was obsolete in doing it. I was no longer needed. It the culture and all of the people that brought the culture up they were sustaining it. So it didn't need my propellant. And when you first got there, Francis, there was, I listened to you describe the workshop you did with employees to A, identify the existing culture, and then if you will, vision the future culture. I, I think it is very practical, if you will, for people listening to get a sense inside of their organizations. How do you get a pulse on the existing culture? And then how do you vision the future culture? Yeah, so for the existing culture, I think particularly if you're in a bad place, what we did is found out which of the cultural values, because this was a company that was driven by its cultural values. And that is an anthropologist would observe that the language of the values was used all the time, all the time. And but the language, instead of being aspirational and optimistic, was being weaponized in some cases. So people were using the cultural values as license to behave badly. And what I learned there is that once a cultural value is weaponized, there's no amount of explaining what you meant that's going to bring it back. You just got to let it go. So the first thing was to figure out and just ask people, what is it about the existing manifestation of the culture is getting in the way of your thriving? And do you observe getting in the way of other people thriving? Two open-ended questions. Oh my goodness. And we would ask that in small groups, loads of small groups, because one person saying something, you could then build on it with others. We also, if people wanted to submit it via an anonymous survey, they could do it there. Like we did it in every nook and cranny way we could, so that we really got a sense to the answer to those two questions. What's getting in the way for you? What's getting in the way for others? Well, the getting in the way for you is why we had to redo the cultural values, keep some of them, but get what would change the others. But then the, we also asked the optimistic questions, what would it take in addition to the values? Like what would make this, uh, this culture one that you could contribute to your highest performance and you think would help others? Like what's your aspirational wish list? And here's the thing, I have found this not just at Uber, but at Uber, nobody was shy in saying this. So it's not like we did a magic trick, <laughs> like literally, we asked everyone in a sincere enough way that they they knew we were going to act on it, and then we acted on it. Um, so I would say it's the Uber employees that should get the Uber employees that were there should get all the credit for this. You know, there was some conducting going on, but it was they are the ones who uh, had the you know they understood the noble purpose. They wanted it to be in a values driven company, and they understood the harm that was being done. I've heard you say that the first four letters of culture are cult. Yeah. And when I think about Uber, when I think about Adam Newman at WeWork, which is another company that you worked with, um, both were sort of larger than life leaders. And I guess my, my question to you is, do you have any examples of those type of, you know, larger than life leaders who create this cult that actually can, can evolve the enterprise from being that type of cult into a sustainable business model. And when I was thinking about this question, Francis, I was thinking about, you know, Steve Jobs, when he created Apple, Steve clearly had a cult behind him. But as we all know, Steve was kicked out and then had to come back on his second act after having gotten some real humble pie to come back and take over Apple and reinvigorate 
Apple with his incredible leadership and quite honestly, the cult that he's created at Apple, which has endured even his passing away. Um, you worked with both of them very closely. What is it about either their leadership capability, but more importantly, like how do we, can those firms actually transition from this idea and the hyper growth into sustainable businesses? Because in both instances, neither of them are longer, no longer at the firm. Yeah, well, I, here's what I would say, two things. One is that particularly in the founding, the founder, whatever their superpowers and whatever their Achilles heel usually gets mirrored in the company, right? The company's just, so when I talk about trust and that it requires authenticity, logic, and empathy, Travis had a self-diagnosed and observable to everyone, an empathy wobble, right? He, he like just empathy got in the way. Um, well, that Adam Newman didn't have an empathy wobble. He had a logic wobble um, that he was like, he was Adam Newman and he, to you totally thought he cared about you. But that S1 that he and his wife ended up writing had no rhyme or reason or logic. So that's a logic wobble. So I would say that they each didn't make it for different reasons. And Travis, I guess, didn't fix the empathy wobble in time. And Adam, I guess, didn't fix the authenticity wobble in time. But every company that I watch from a founder is ends up being a reflection of the founder in the strengths and the weaknesses. Those two just happen to be the high profile. But, you know, um, I would say that, uh, uh, what's the awesome technology company that has the I don't know, you, you can think of the technology, he's not coming to mind, but the, the founders like Jeff Bezos at Amazon, Amazon is a reflection of Jeff Bezos. Oh my gosh, if Amazon had a pulse, it would work out as much as he does. It would right. be like, it's, it's um, but it doesn't have to be at the founding. Like if you look now, Microsoft, which had Bill Gates, which was a reflection of him for its blessings and its curses. Now with Satya Nadella, it's a reflection of him. And so he's a person where it's like, there seem to be very few Achilles heels. <laughs> it's actually all quite marvelous. And the company is now a reflection of him. So I think that, you know, whether or not a person should be the one who stays, you know, let's say you like an early, you know, serial entrepreneurs don't want to stay at a company. Like I don't have the same romanticism about one person staying with a company for life. Um, I think you should stay for as long as it's appropriate for you to stay. And then you should have the humility to give the baton to someone, to someone else. So you talked about logic wobbles and empathy wobbles. Um, when you were at Uber, one of the things you were wildly transparent on was that there was a lack of trust. And during all that work, you created the trust triangle. Can you describe to our listeners what the trust triangle yeah. is and, and those various component parts to it? Yeah. And so the reason we call it the trust triangle is because there's three component parts to trust. So you are more likely to trust me, for example, if you get a sense of my authenticity, logic and empathy. And I'll tell you what I mean by those words. If if you sense that I it's the, like I'm speaking in a way that it's true, I'm honest, it's representative of my beliefs, then that's necessary for trust. If you think I'm dishonest, if you think I'm saying one thing to you and another thing to someone else, that is I'm being inauthentic, nothing else matters, you're not gonna trust me. Authenticity is necessary, but not sufficient. It has to be the real me that you sense. You have to also believe that I have a good rigorous plan and I have to be transparent enough about the plan so that you can see the rigor in it. And I think that the business model in WeWork, for example, with Adam, parts of it didn't make sense. Um, uh, and so there wasn't as much transparency on that. Well, a lack of transparency just gets people to not trust you. Um, so if, but if it's the real me with a rigorous plan and I am inclusive of you, then you're gonna trust me. And I, you believe I'm considering you in all of that magical calculus. So. Every time we're trusted, all three of these things are present. So we all have the capacity to do it. And any time, any one of the people listening, just look back at any time you have not earned the amount of trust you wanted. Take that real situation and ask yourself, did your skeptic doubt your authenticity, your logic, or your empathy? And I would stake anything on the fact that it's one of those three. And the reason I can say that is we've done it with hundreds of thousands of people 
Um, so we started it at Uber. We've done it with so many people now that, and so many organizations that I feel super confident that it's going to be one of those three. And the reason you need to know is the prescriptions of an authenticity wobble are very different than a logic wobble than, um, than an empathy wobble. So I want to dive into the three of them in a moment, but you, you've used the term wobble a number of times. And, yeah. I, and I love the term wobble uh, in the sense that you're not saying it's a deficit. You're not saying that it's a character flaw, et cetera. It's not an accusatorial term. It's a, it's a, you know, we all are human. We have wobbles here. We're not authentic enough. We're not logical enough, et cetera, et cetera. But my question to you is that when I think about it in the concept of Uber and WeWork, what there really kind of seems to have been is more of a breach on one of these and less of a wobble. Okay. And I'm just curious about, you know, you, you, you state when you, when you were working with WeWork, they were about to go public. You mentioned the S1 that they'd filed. And the, I think the, the, the talk valuation on WeWork at that time was $40 billion. And the, I looked up the market cap of WeWork today and it's about 1.1 billion. Um, and so I guess my question would be, how can investors, employees, partners, identify when that wobble turns into a breach or is gonna turn into a breach? Yeah, so I would say that at Uber, the reason you could realize it was a breach is that riders felt great about the consumption of the service at Uber. Riders were disappointed about how they thought Uber was treating drivers, but it wasn't the service model that they were sad about. Um, and they thought that Uber didn't have good empathy of the drivers. They didn't think that, you know, regulators thought that Uber didn't have good empathy of them. Investors thought that they didn't. So empathy was the common problem. And I think that goes from a wobble to a breach when it's everywhere. Now, the good news about that, it's one solve. If we can learn how to overcome an empathy wobble, click, 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 we solve it for all of it. So I think that's how we knew it was a breach there. It was, it was so omnipresent. At, I think it's a different case at WeWork. So at WeWork, Look, one way you go, you make sure it's not a breach is you bring in trusted outside, best in class outside people to help. So nobody should have believed Adam in what the valuation of the company was because he has a logic wobble. But here's the place where that really fell down. They brought in the best, most prestigious investment banks. I mean, the best, and they brought in more than one. They brought in the best, most prestigious law firms. And they brought in more than one. And they gave it the evaluation. Now that, I, how do you solve that? I mean, get better partners, but how do you get better partners when like everyone would have said, these are great partners. So I actually think that's quite a complicated situation and I'm not sure how to solve that because paying for that advice is supposed to protect you from one person having crazy thoughts, but instead they amplified it. Um, so that's what I think was going on there. So the breach, I believe, came when the trusted partners abdicated their responsibility. I, I'm sure the investment banks that worked on that are appreciative of you not mentioning them by name, even though I know exactly who they are um, and continue to work with them, by the way. Um, so. Uh, on, on the various components of the trust triangle, um, one of the ones that you say is without a doubt, the one that people fall down on or have more wobbles is on empathy. And one of the things you've teed up is technology and the fact that technology undermines empathy. Talk for a moment about that first meeting you were in at Uber oh. with everyone texting about the meeting and then how you guided people to getting empathy front and center and getting the technology off the table. Yeah. So when Travis asked when I finally came in after meeting with everyone in every context I could and I joined, he asked me to um, facilitate the senior team while he was there. And then when he left, the board asked me to continue doing that. Um, but even, so even while he was there, he he was there and then we, you know, he said, do I need to stay? I was like, no, like I, I got it. We'll we'll do this here. So we're having the meeting and I was first surprised at how much multitasking was going on. Um, because it was, it's like super disrespectful to other people around the table. And, and I just was surprised. I hadn't seen it in other parts of Uber, by the way, but in this room, it was palpable. And then I found out what they were texting and they were texting one another about the meeting we were sitting in. If I can use Amy Edmondson's, there was no psychological safety. If you say something, somebody's going to be sending a zinger back and forth. I like, 
And so it blew my mind. And I just said, I, this blows my mind. And we collectively are not going to be able to achieve what we collectively want to achieve if we're undermining one another minute to minute and moment to moment. So we took a page out of HBS in the classrooms, right? Imagine if people could have technology in the classrooms, it would be a terrible thing. Uh, so we just had technology off and away. So everybody would put their technology over on a table, we put charging station there so that you could do it. And you'd be at the table. And then if you needed to go use your technology, you just went and used it over there. Um, and here's what changed. Everything started going faster. Because you didn't have to revisit when one person was paying attention, or you didn't. And there was a lot of relitigating things after the meeting because it wasn't really, but we did all the stuff in the meetings. So we did a whole bunch of things, but you know, the organization had never achieved so much in so little time because they had all of these incredibly smart people who were now no longer participating in this bad behavior. So it was, for the most part, good people behaving badly, and we just had to change the conditions. There were a few people, you know, we ended up having to separate from 20 people in June of 2017, and that was necessary to turn around the culture, but it was only 20 out of 13,000. Like that, to me, was a total wake-up call, that when people say, oh, it's, you know, like, you know, read Uber, everything has to change. Well, everything but the employees, the employees were awesome, awesome. That's super interesting in the sense, and I've heard you talk about this, in, in, in that there's a sense when you've got a company of 13,000 people that had made what I called them breaches, you didn't, but let's just say wobbles, to the degree that Uber had, that the organization is doomed. And I think it's so interesting that it was really that there were 20 people who were holding were, if you will, reinforcing the culture that was there. And that the moment you made those changes, which were relatively very small, it then opened the avenue. And that I think a lot of people get caught up in that, oh, this company is done, the culture inside of it, or a team for that matter. And I want to talk about coaching in a moment, but that a, that a team just, you know, XYZ sports program has been at the bottom of the league forever and ever. And there's no way to kind of change it because everyone is living this defeatist culture. And what you have seen very clearly and also coach to is find those people who are holding it back and who are making the old way stay in place. You move them out and you can really make a change. In fact, if you offer me the best team in the league or the worst team in the league, I'll take the worst team in the league as long as they realize that they have to change. Because all it takes is the willingness to change. And then we know how to do it. We know what the secret memos are. But if I go back to Uber, just here's one illustrative example. Almost all of the problems the company could be traced back to an interaction somebody was having with their manager. Didn't matter where you were in the company. Well, there were 3,000 managers at the company. So there were either 3,000 bad people or there were 3,000 people who were never taught how to manage. And it didn't take long to realize, oh my gosh, these guys graduated from a technical college. They came in as an individual contributor. They got promoted five minutes later to a manager. They got promoted five minutes after that to a manager of managers and no one ever taught them how to do it. Of course it's not working. So I would say that's not the employee's fault. That's the infrastructure, like the organization didn't set them up for success. So we put in management training and all of those problems went away. So I look at, is there, if, if a lot of people have the same problem, we're a secret memo away from fixing it. Now, if Uber had tens of thousands of different problems, I don't think it would have been an easy fix. I think about Dara, uh, Tara Kajrahaki, who's now the CEO of Uber, and um, I've known Dara for a long time, and his personality kind of, in hindsight, looks like the perfect match. Um, but there were a lot of people who were interviewed by the board for the job of being Travis's replacement. Um, I think also Jeff Immel actually what might yeah. have actually been mixed there yeah. for a while. Given the value destruction that Jeff Immel brought to GE, I think any Uber shareholder is probably happy they, that they dodged that. But I guess my, I've, you have a quote, which I think is fantastic on leadership. And it's leadership is about empowering other people as a result of your presence and making sure that impact continues into your absence. Daryl would seem to be the perfect, perfect. person perfect. along the lines. Yeah. And I think, Why? Uh, well, because he is. He, he lives in this way. So Travis was at the center of everyone's life at Uber. And so you could do well in his presence. And if something was going wrong, you'd go right to him. 
Dara has no, his ego does not require him <laughs> to be, and I'm not saying it was ego for Kravitz, it's just how he did it. But Dara, he like wants nothing more than you to thrive in his absence. So he's not gonna micromanage, but he's gonna give you the tools you need. He's gonna let you go experiment um, and let you come back. So he is, um, he's like all set. He's deeply comfortable in his own skin. He was, and I, you know, the board did, the search committee on the board, they, bravo. I mean, bravo for going through all of those other people who were the who's who of who you would want and being like, no, 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 no. And then, ah, uh, this is the person. I don't even know how they found him. I didn't know who he was before uh, meeting him there. And to your point, he is exactly right. So I give credit to the board for doing the exhaustive search and they found someone they didn't know. And usually we hire the best of the people we know. And my theory on the world is that the best of the people we don't know is always better than the best of the people we do know. So go make new friends, go find, go learn. And that's exactly what they did. And they got the perfect person for it. Uh, I talked about coaching for a moment and I've heard you talk about feedback and you're not, I'm going to put words in your mouth for a moment, but you're not a big fan of sort of the annual critical review process of saying, hey, Francis, you're falling down on this and next year you need to do this better. And you're much more towards A, making people awesome and B, giving positive feedback. And I've heard you talk a number of times about the quotient of positive feedback to critical analysis needs to be at a minimum five to one and potentially even on some studies up to 10 to one. Talk a little bit about the positive reinforcement, positive feedback versus the critical thinking. Yeah, so I'm in operations management, right? So everything, I just look at everything about how much better can we be tomorrow than we are today. One of the greatest accelerants of somebody's performance is to tell them what they're doing right, specifically so they can do more of it tomorrow. So I wanna give positive, re I wanna catch you doing things right so that you'll do more of them. Because at the, otherwise, at the end of today, you'll be like, oh, on balance, you had a great day. I have no idea what to do more of and what to do less of. And now some people prefer to focus on, here are the two things to do wrong, that you did wrong, fix those. What we have found, and you, know, you can learn this from watching dogs being trained, if there's a well-behaved dog, they got a lot of sincere and specific praise for when they did things right. And that helps them improve at a really steep slope really fast. So now it's not that you don't need some constructive advice, but so much less than people are naturally giving. Like we somehow think that positive reinforcement is like weak, or like I, I don't know what, it, like, or like infantilizing. When I wanna do it, I am ruthlessly competitive. Like I will gnaw off a limb to win. The best thing I have to help my team win over your team is to catch them doing things right, specifically so they can do more of it. And to do it in public so that everybody else can learn what doing something right is and they'll do more of it. Just it's breathtaking, the improvement. So I got there from the improvement part of it. And when people give an annual constructive review, you like I, my heart just crumbles. You have denied the improvement opportunity to another human being. I just don't understand it. And it is absolutely suboptimal. So I, um, th that makes me think about the, if you will, exceptions to the rule. Because you, you, the research, I've, I've heard you state research after research, it all says, this is there. You need to do five to one, if not 10 to one. Uh, and then uh, someone comes up with, yeah, but I've watched a coach who screams at their players all the time. And you've said, yeah, but Watch them when the camera's not on them. They're patting them on the rear end. They're giving them a high five. They're, they're doing a lot of positive reinforcement for that one, hey, Charlie, or hey, Susie, you missed the jump shot at the buzzer, and I'm disappointed at you for not doing that. But the one in the business context that I'm just curious whether you have any thoughts on is Ray Dalio and Bridgewater. Yeah. Because he not only has written plenty about this, but their sort of uh, combative, you know, yeah take everyone apart in the, in the, in the conference room. And if you, if you, if you say something that's stupid, everyone lets you know it. How has Bridgewater been successful? Because it seems like their ratio is the inverse of what you're talking yeah. about. They, they praise each other once and they criticize each other five times. Yeah. So uh, here's what I would say. First of all, do you know any other organizations that are designed like that successfully? No. No. Do you think that that organization is going to last beyond him in that same style? 
No. no. So we could talk about it, but why? Huh. That's great. Yeah. I would say that Ray Dalio is probably an enormously charismatic man. Yeah. Um, so in your book, Unleashed, um, you talk about leadership and how everyone can lead to make the collective better and stronger. Um, and, and the leader's job is really to help others do better. And so as we've talked about this frame of, of, of great leaders who got companies going, Travis had 13,000 employees working for him. Um, but at the same time, everything led back to Travis. As you think about sustainable leadership, sustainable breakthrough businesses. It's very clear that the leadership model you're focused on is leaders who actually aren't at the center of everything, but are leaders who have sort of, if you will, disseminated decision-making. For, for those people like myself who try and play as active a role in leading Walker and Dunlop as I possibly can, how do you, how do you what's, the, what's the coaching that you would give to someone as it relates to how involved you need to be versus the empowerment of those around you? Well, I would start with quality of life. Like if you're going to be completely involved all day, every day, 24 seven nights, weekends, so that you're always on and the company isn't too dramatically big and you're willing to sacrifice your life on the altar of that, go ahead. But to me in the like scheme of things, that's a hobby business. It's you haven't prepared it to hand it off to anyone. You haven't like you haven't prepared the people for your absence. And I'm not saying you, Willie. I have no idea. I, I, uh, I but one uh, for one. So I don't find that to be sustainable. I find it's very ego nourishing for people um, that we are so critically needed. But if I went and watched you, Willie, because I have read a ton about you now, I am sure you are setting people up for success in your absence. Like I am sure that you let people go and make and make mistakes on their own so that they can learn from them. Like I just, I see how you, uh, I, I, I've learned about you. And so I would be just so surprised if you didn't do it. So I can be actively engaged in coaching you, in developing you, but I'm letting you go learn the lessons on your own. You're learning how to make judgments in my absence not come to me for each of the each of the decisions. So talk about high standards and deep devotion. Yeah. So uh, uh, um, for most mortal human beings, we know two things. One, people tend to thrive in the presence of high standards, right? So if I gave you someone who set high standards for you and somebody sets low standards, in general, we're going to do better when there's high standards, when there's something for us to reach for. There's another thing that in general, we all know. If if you are with someone who is devoted to your success, all things being equal, you're going to do better. So, and both of these things in concert are like, this is the dream. If I have someone who I, who I experience as having high standards and I simultaneously experience as being deeply devoted to my success, that's magic. Like that's the beautiful place of leadership for most of us. In our day to day practice, if you look at it, we act as if these two things trade off against each other. So when we are setting high standards to someone, we shield them from our devotion to their success. We're almost like cool and cold and calculated. And then maybe we got some feedback that we're cool and cold and calculated. And so we're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to reveal how deeply devoted I am to your success. And I insidiously lower the standards. And then we give ourselves feedback about how disgusted we are with that. And we go back and forth on that off diagonal. Some people for their whole lives go back and forth on that. But when we, as soon as we realize that, oh, it's not a trade-off, it's not bad in the service of great, I can actually do both at the same time. But the prescription when I have deep devotion only and get to go up to high standards and deep devotion is very different than the prescription if I have high standards only. So this, like, I have a prescription for great leadership. It depends which quadrant you're in. Don't give me a generic one. It's going to work 50% of the time, and then I'm going to think it's unreliable. I was listening to CNBC a couple of weeks ago, and Paul Tudor Jones was on. And he was talking about ESG. And he was basically saying he thinks that ESG ought to be rebranded SGE because the environmental issue is so much of a political hot potato. and it's not really where most corporations are focused as it relates to social issues and governance issues. And so he's sort of like, let's get the acronym right because 
environmental seems to push us off the deep end as far as how politically volatile it is, and we ought to be focusing on the bigger issues of S, G, and then E. You on D and I, diversity and inclusion, have said we ought to swap those, and rather than D and I, D, E, and I, it ought to be I and D. Talk about inclusion being necessary for diversity. Yeah, so if I, uh, if I bring a diverse team together, I have the potential to thump everyone else. Like the more difference I can accumulate, the more surface area I can cover, the more potential I have for excellence and for innovation and for all of it. Potential. So diversity has potential and we, you, we fulfill the potential when we are inclusive of the diversity. So I have found many organizations, many organizations today are on a diversity treadmill. They bring in folks who they think are different. They're doing it for the right reasons. They haven't been inclusive of them. They don't last very long. They go out and they're on a diversity treadmill. They're not getting any better at any of the metrics that matter. Cynicism is taking place in the organization. It's terrible for the people they're bringing in and it's terrible for everyone else. It's a vicious cycle down. When we think, let's start with diversity. But I have never found an organization that worked to become inclusive that didn't have magnificent diversity follow. Because when we are known as being an inclusive place that really celebrates your unique contribution, uh, word will get out and amazing things will happen. So I very much believe it should be I and D. So I, one of the favorite quotes I have from one of your books is, whenever strategy is silent, culture fills the space. Talk about that for a second, because yeah. it's so good. <laughs> is that, well, part of it is in response to, oh, one of them eats the other as a snack or something like that. And what Anne and I realized is that if we're going to guide discretionary behavior in our absence, there's only two ways people know what will make the decisions we want them to make. One is if the strategy is super clear. So that, and you're like, oh, this is in line with the strategy, this isn't. But the, when the strategy isn't crystal clear on something, it's the culture that guides our discretionary behavior. So I don't think one is more important than the other. I think there is a sequence to it. Set your strategy. And if your strategy is comprehensive and super clear, you don't have to rely very much on culture. But if your strategy, if I go and ask 10 people at your company the strategy and they all give me 10 different answers, your culture better be freaking magnificent because that's the thing that's guiding people. So I do believe everywhere where strategy is silent, that's the work of culture. And so the culture will be more or less important in the more like um, of a lifeline to the organization, depending on the understanding of the strategy. I also will say so many organizations have great strategies in the senior suite. Like the C-suite can articulate a beautiful strategy, but it doesn't trickle its way down to everyone else in the organization. And that's the same as not having a good strategy because it's not actually, it's my understanding of the strategy guides the behavior. And it, when I walk around with senior leaders and talk to people on the front line, they are startled to hear what has happened on the trickle down effect. And so the communication of it is it's often either the strategy is broken or the communication of the strategy is broken. So finally, your, your, your wife and your partner on two books on starting a business and raising two boys, uh, Anne, um, one of the most, I would tell you, romantic things I've ever heard is an interview you did where you say that I try to earn the right to be married to Anne every day. And I've rarely, the way you said it, Francis was so meaningful and real. And I, and, and I guess one of the questions I have for you is, how do you consciously do that? Oh, um, I, so I have Anne on my shoulder. It's almost like, you know, let's say I've accomplished more than some of my colleagues. It's unfair because I have Anne. <laughs> right? So <laughs> it's not a fair fight. And I have the humility of that. And she is like, gets high standards and deep devotion for everyone. She has like, she and is, has a noble purpose in the world and understands we are of service. And she, the best part of me can show up around her. And the best part of me is one that is better tomorrow than I am today and better the next day than I am today. And so to be worthy of my having such an unfair advantage, 
I, it's okay if I make a mistake, but I really prefer it's a new mistake <laughs> and that I can learn from that. And that old mistakes I feel like is not uh, honoring Anne, particularly if it's something that she's guided me on. So I feel like I have an unfair advantage in the world. I also, I wanna say, had the courage to ask her to marry me and I had the intelligence to go out and ask for permission from her family first. And they said no, but I stayed there until they said, oh, okay. It's not like these things last forever. And that was all There's, the yes I need, all the yes that, I need. That brings us full circle to being number six and to being turned down by Harvard five times before you finally got the offer, which I love. And is a, is a great way to wrap this up. Um, Francis, we are all much better for all of your great work, all of your great teaching. Uh, I'm deeply appreciative of you spending an hour talking about all this with me. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next time I'm back at HBS. And thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation and the conversation. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, Francis.